Good afternoon. This is the third session of this uh, course. So today I'd like uh, to finish the proof of the global approximation theorem. And also uh, I want to start the lecture three and hopefully finish it. But first, uh, a couple of comments. Uh, the first one is uh, about a reference, because some people ask me uh, about the paper where this global approximation theorem is proved. So uh, the reference is... So if I, if I forget, you, if I forget uh, to tell you about uh, reference or something, just uh, please ask me. So th this, is, this was proved uh, in a paper with my colleague uh, Alberto Enciso. And it's uh, in Acta Mathematica a couple of years ago. Although the original, the, the first version, uh, appeared uh, in 2012, the article. So it took a bit long, the review process. <laughs> okay. And second comment is about uh, questions I'd like to encourage uh, students to ask me. If you are shy to ask during the lecture, you can ask later when I finish, no problem. Because professors ask all of them, but no students. So I'm not sure if the students are sleeping well, <laughs> while I'm <laughs> talking, or simply you understand everything and no, I have no questions. Or <laughs> so please, uh, I'd be <laughs> glad to interact uh, with you. Okay. So let's continue with uh, with this proof. So yesterday uh, we constructed. Uh, so what we want. Is, uh, is the following. We have a, a solution of uh, the Helmholtz equation, solution B, in, in, which is defined in a compact set K. So this is the picture of what we have. It's, uh, we have, uh, say, a compact set K. And here we have a solution of the Helmholtz equation. I call it V. This solves uh, Laplacian plus one acting of V is equal to zero in some neighborhood, n of k. So v is actually defined in this n. <coughs> and yesterday, <coughs> after several uh, procedures, uh, first uh, uh, with a brute force extension using a cutoff function, and then uh, using green functions, discretization of integral by Riemann sums, and then uh, using Han Banach theorem, uh, a kind of abstract uh, functional analytic argument, uh, we, we were able to, to construct a function which is defined uh, in the whole space, but it, but it has uh, a set of singularities, uh, point uh, discrete singularities, which are contained in certain set U. And this U is contained in the complement of some of some big ball. This will be a, and here we constructed then a function uh, that they call it uh, U3. So U3 is a linear combination. Linear combination of Green's functions. Green functions uh, of this operator, of Laplacian plus one in Euclidean space, with poles uh, with finitely many poles contained in U. Okay, this we constructed yesterday. And uh, if you follow the procedure, uh, what we have is uh, so we can define a function U4, which is uh, H plus U3. Remember this H, I introduced it yesterday. It's simply a, a solution to the, to the Helmholtz equation. And then when you add this U3, which is some linear combination of green functions with poles here, you get that this U4, when you compare, when you compare U4 with your function V, 
uniformly uh, on the set k, this is a small. Okay, this follows from all the construction yesterday. Okay. So the point is that uh, this U4 still is not a, a global solution to the Hempel equation, right? Because uh, it's defined everywhere except for these uh, finitely many poles. So uh, how now? Because in the in the global approximation theorem we state that there exists a global solution, so no poles at all, no singularities. So how can we get uh, this uh, global solution? So now there are two paths to to follow. There are two ways to proceed. In the first one, uh, we can iterate this balayage of poles that I explained yesterday, just to push. <coughs> all these singularities to infinity. This can be done. And not, it wasn't done in this paper, it's done in, in a previous paper, because at that moment we didn't know how to uh, do in a different way. But uh, the problem with this uh, procedure, the procedure of pushing singularities to infinity, say along certain region in the complement of this ball, is that uh, you can't control the, the function that you get with this procedure. This procedure gives you a, a, a function defined everywhere on the whole Euclidean space, which indeed solves, uh, solves the Hempel equation, but it uh, is not bounded, uh, neither from uh, below nor from above. It, there are some uh, uh, directions uh, where the function tends to infinity and tends to minus infinity. So it is not what we want. We, we want a mounted solution and actually a solution that tends to zero at infinity. So for this we follow a totally different approach, which actually is not uh, very complicated. And for this uh, we need uh, two ingredients, which are elementary. The first one is uh, simply spherical, uh, spherical coordinates. So uh, no negative radius and theta will denote the point in the unit m minus 1 sphere. Okay, spherical coordinates, you saw one. And now, the second ingredient is that, is, uh, that any function on, on the sphere, on this uh, uh, n minus 1 dimensional unit sphere, there is a natural basis. There is a natural basis for any two functions. The basis is the spherical harmonic spherical harmonics, uh, you can write any function as the sum, in M2 sense, of spherical harmonics. So spherical harmonics, I denote them by this way, labeled by a couple of constants. So IL will be non-negative integers. Integer, and this uh, M, it's also a set of integers, set of integers, integers which depends on L, and also on the dimension. You can describe explicitly uh, this in some way, for example, but it's not needed. For example, in the case of n equal 3, a standard spherical harmonics on the two-dimensional sphere, so you have that go L goes from 0 to infinity, and then M belongs to minus L to L. This is the standard spherical harmonics in the, for the two dimension. For N bigger than 3, you also can describe uh, this set IFL, but it's not needed. Okay, we do not need uh, this description here. Simply, it's, uh, it's a basis of uh, orthonormal basis. In L2. So we will use the, these two elementary objects for the construction. So we have this function u4. u4 uh, is not defined everywhere, but on the ball of radius r, it is well defined, of course. So u, 
u4 satisfies Laplacian plus 1 acting on u4 is equal to 0 in the ball of radius r, okay? Because the poles are outside this ball. So now if you write u4 in this in spherical coordinates, this for each radius, this I'm going to write this function for any point in the in the ball of radius r. So for each radius, this of course a function, a smooth function of the angle on the sphere. So you can expand this function for each radius in terms of the in terms of the uh, spherical harmonics. So this is actually a sum this type okay. here with some coefficients which of course will depend on R these constants will depend on the radius and here the spherical harmonics and this uh, is understood for this convergence this convergence in L2. Okay? So you can represent this U4 in this way. Actually, the convergence is much better than L2, but L2 is, is enough. It's okay. Mm -hmm. So now, an exercise for the students is that uh, these radial functions are not anything. You can compute, uh, actually, this is simply, uh, you can write them this way. This is simply the integral. Sorry. Yes, uh, <coughs> since this is an orthonormal basis, orthonormal basis, you, you can simply write for each radius uh, this constant. This is the integral over S n minus one of u four. D theta, this is the measure on the unit on the sphere, yes. Mm -hmm. Standard measure on the unit on the unit sphere of dimension n minus one. Okay, so these are these coefficients. And now uh, so you see that they are smooth, etc. No problem. So the exercise is that. Is that of course this U4 solves uh, solves the PD solves the PD. So this is not anything. This you can compute what, what these coefficients are. So actually, this and, and this U4 is is uh, smooth at the origin. It's a smooth is smooth at the origin. So this is uh, so using this integral expression, you can check that this solves. Uh, when, when you separate variables here in the, the radial and the angular variable, this, this solves the radial the radial equation. The, sorry, this, this solves the radial equation. So you have an ODE, second order ODE. You have two solutions, independent. One is smooth at the origin, the other is not even continuous because it's not bounded. You must choose the, the good one, the smooth one. So finally, this is simply a constant, which depends on the on Lm and uh, this uh, function here, these are simply this so called n dimensional hyperspherical spherical vessel function. This is function of first. Actually, it, uh, there is a uh, in the equation because of the uh, spherical symmetry. This doesn't depend. This only depends on the this L, this number L, not on M. The dependence on M is, of course, in the constant. It's the constant. Okay. So please do the. It's, it's a computation. Uh, 
directly with the expression, you can check that this solves the radial equation, the radial equation that one gets separating variables here, and then it's, uh, you, you get uh, this expression for the radial uh, function. Okay. So, so we see that uh, this rep representation of U4, which is of course a good only on the ball, uh, this, this is not global, this, is, this, this does not hold in the whole space, this is just on the ball, but this is enough for our purposes because now what we can do, this is why, this is why we, uh, we wanted uh, to push uh, the singularities away from some ball because we want to use this representation. Okay, if, uh, if you have the singularities in, in the ball, you can't do this. But now uh, we are in, in the position to define, to define the, the, the global solution that is stated, that we claim to exist in the statement of the theory. This is simply the following. U is defined as a truncation. Let's truncate this series. The series converges in L2, right? Actually, we will see now in one minute that it's much better the convergence because the lift is regular. But uh, now let's truncate. Let's truncate this and just let's take uh, some L naught. So we truncate. Instead of summing from 0 to infinity, we sum till some L naught, of course positive, and the series and the corresponding. M. and here are the constants. I already write this expression. Okay. So then for L not large enough, this is a good approximation of U4 in L2 sense. So if you measure the difference of U4 minus or of u minus u4 and you compute the L2 norm in the ball of radius r, this is uh, as small as you want. Okay? Because of convergence in L2 sense. So we are truncating. But now uh, there are two observations. First, this u satisfies the Hempel equation. Each one of these elements satisfies the first type of equation. These are obtained just separating the uh, because it's separated. You can just separate the equation, the Hempel equation, in the radial and angular coordinates. So each one of these solves an Hempel. Sometimes uh, you can see this kind of representation as a Fourier vessel series. It's a kind of <laughs> okay. So then, you satisfy, you solve the temple. So the Laplacian plus one of u is equal to zero. This is the first uh, property. And there is a second property, which is that u is global itself. U is global. Each one of these is global. You can write them in, in Cartesian coordinates, actually. So you see, uh, of course, it's, it's pretty well defined that the origin is smooth. It solves uh, the PGE. So by elliptic regularity, it's much, much is good. And, and also, it exists, uh, or it makes sense away from, the, away from the ball, of course. There are, I mean, you can see it because it's, a, it, it's a global object. But even uh, I am uh, thinking here of the Hempel's equation, you can apply this procedure to more general PDEs, so for them you don't need to have explicit expressions, but then what you do to, to prove glo uh, globality is just analyzing the ODE. And the, the ODE will have, uh, the, the ODE for the radial function, it's very easy to, to see if the solution is global or not, just seeing if coefficients are bounded or this kind of thing. That, that's not complicated. So it's a global. So U is global. So it's false in the whole space. 
<coughs> Marem, and not only global, but now exercise. Also. The decay. You have decay. <coughs> you 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 know pretty well the asymptotics of the of the vessel functions. This is spherical vessel functions at infinity. <coughs> so you you check. It's easy to check that uh, u decays u decays at infinity as r to the power r to the power 1 minus n over 2. Okay? Yes, uh, do this as an exercise. Just checking, uh, you can go to Wikipedia <laughs> and <laughs> to check the asymptotic properties of this, or you can do it with the ODE, even. There are uh, many ways to do this. <laughs> so, this gives you this decay, this is for each one of these objects. So. It's a finite sum, so of course uh, you have this decay for the whole. <coughs> so this gives you the decay in the statement of the theorem. This gives you the decay. And uh, so now the, the only so this U is our global solution. Now the only remaining point is that in the statement of the theorem, I didn't say that the approximation is in L2. I said that it's much much better. It's in C K. Uh, okay. So now. To pass from L2 to, to CK, it's uh, easy, or it's a standard. So just uh, interior elliptic estimates. So we have the L2. So we have that u. What did I write? Uh, u minus u4 is small in L2. Okay. So now let's take uh, an R prime smaller than R. Now interior interior. Elliptic estimates because, of course, this uh, difference satisfies the equation equal to zero. So then you can promote uh, or you can bound, say, u minus u4 uh, uniformly if you want, to be our prime. Is smaller than some constant, which will depend only on the set uh, times this u minus u4 uh, 2. So this is smaller than c delta. Okay. So we are we are essentially done because. Uh, so now uh, we say that this u and u4 are close uniformly in some ball smaller than, than br, but it's still containing, still containing, k okay, still is contained in br prime. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just uh, to prove the statement of the theorem, you you want to you want to compare u and v, the local solution. And the global. This is the local and this is the global. Say uniformly. Okay? So for this, this is just by definition. This is V1. Remember that V1 was this cutoff function times V. So since the cutoff is equal to 1 on set K, then this is exactly the same. You are comparing u1 and v1, and now using the, the estimates obtained yesterday all along the procedure when you change v1, so v1 is uh, h uh, plus v2, maybe, or 
etc. Then you change. Uh, this is uh, integral representation with real function. Do you discretize? You are always adding an error of size delta, size delta, size delta. So finally, and using uh, the, this final truncation, this is the sum constant times delta. Okay. And uh, you are almost done. You get uniform. That U and V are uniformly close. If you want to go, I, I, I wasn't very careful defining the sets because I didn't want to introduce much notation. If you want to prove that you can even do uh, approximation for the derivatives, then this is not, a, this is not an issue again by the elliptic regularity. You, you can already do this for some k, k prime, which is strictly contained in k. Again, by interior estimates, you can you can do this. Sorry. Okay. So for some k prime smaller, strictly smaller than k, uh, this is already done. It's it, it immediate consequence using again the interior estimates. But uh, okay, in the statement I said uh, I didn't say there exists uh, k prime, uh, but it's not needed. The only the only point is to repeat all the argument, defining, uh, working. I mean, you have k, you set k, and then uh, remember we have this n, this open set where everything holds. Just uh, consider a k prime strictly bigger than k, and uh, you can do everything. So it's easy. I didn't want to do it because it's just uh, easy when you understand the proof and uh, it introduces more notation. But uh, actually, you can get the statement of the result. And uh, and this is so. This finishes the proof of the global approximation theorem. As you say, as you see, it's uh, it's quite easy. The, once you have the, the solution defined in a ball. And uh, to define the, the solution in the world, this U4, you need to apply all these arguments of Green's functions, the Palajash of poles with the Hambanak, etc. When you have the, the U4 defined in the world, then it's quite elementary. Just writing uh, the solution using the standard decomposition in the radial and angular variables and truncating the series. And this, uh, that is apparently only L2 approximation, it's actually CK because uh, you have, because everything solves the PDE and you have the interior elliptic estimates. So L2 approximation promotes automatically in a smaller subset to a uniform approximation or CK approximation. So this is all. And this is why we can control the behavior at infinity. So your global solution, as you see, it's um, it's not um, it's not constructive um, because we use uh, well, maybe this Hamanag application is not constructive, but um, but it, it, it's expressed in terms of elementary functions. Um, so probably uh, well, not probably. <laughs> there are some groups in Germany. Who can do some numerics with this? And uh, if you are given the v, the function v, it's just a matter of finding you have this basis. It's just a matter of, of finding a, an L naught large enough and these coefficients, these uh, constants, which approximate in L2. So, which is easier uh, numerically to see this L2 approximation than controlling derivative. You don't need to control any derivative. Yes, if, if you Look, this if you find uh, a, a combination, a linear combination of this, which approximates in L2 sense your local solution, it's, a, it's automatically an approximation in the, uh, in the uniform sense because of the elliptic regularity. And this can be done. So, it's, uh, in some sense, it can be implemented in, in a computer. Okay. So, with this, uh, we finish the proof of the global approximation. And so if there are no questions, we can uh, start uh, the third uh, lecture, which is the application. Yeah. Yeah, during the procedure, and then you, 
right and then V1 to the edge plus V2. Right. And then it's, that would be one in the solution of the thermal equation. But why you introduce this edge? Oh, the, the edge, you need it because uh, it's not true in general. So, what we saw is that. Let's see. <coughs> So we saw that the Laplacian plus <coughs> one acting on V1 is equal to some density. I don't remember, maybe I call it F. Uh, so, of course, uh, a function defined as the convolution of the Green's function with F indeed uh, <coughs> satisfies this. This, v, this is the V2, right? V2 is defined as the convolution of G with F. And indeed, V2 satisfies the same PD, but you don't have uniqueness. Uh, uh, because it's oscillating, there is no maximum principle to say that, so this satisfies P. But V1 and V2 don't need to be the same, in principle. They are the same. If you do this procedure for harmonic functions, for example, uh, indeed, uh, Indeed, uh, they are the same because uh, there are no bounded harmonic functions. There are no bounded. But uh, here, uh, they don't need to be the same. They are not, actually, in general, for general problem. So you need. So the only thing that you know is that V1 is equal to V2 plus some H that solves the homogeneous equation. And that's, that's why you need to introduce this H satisfies Laplacian plus 1. Because you need, in general, you need to add uh, this extra edge. It's not important for the argument because uh, later what we do is we work in the truncation. The representation is for the whole uh, v3 plus h. So, so at the end of the day, you don't see the h. But during the argument, you need uh, to, to use the h. And that's a very good question because. In the Acta Mathematica paper, we forgot the eight. <laughs> and the referee, the referees, even after three years of uh, review process, didn't realize that an eight is needed. <laughs> so we, we realized later about it. <laughs> so at the end of the day, the stake then is right. But, uh, and you don't, uh, actually, you don't see the eight in the final, <laughs> at the end of the argument, but uh, you, need, uh, you want it to be right, <laughs> you need to write it. <laughs> so let's. Um, so other questions? Okay, so let's go to lecture three. So, I'm going to apply these uh, two results. So lecture three is about a nodal set. of solutions to Hempel. except for the fact that you cannot ensure decay at infinity on any non-compact manifold. If you consider a non-compact manifold, no boundary, and uh, the Hempworth equation, for example, with the metric, with, uh, you, you endow your manifold with Riemannian metric, then you can do exactly the same. <laughs> Up to the part uh, that uh, you represent uh, your function using these spherical harmonics, etc. Is not possible. So then, uh, what you do if you want a global approximation or Riemannian manifold is to follow the first uh, path that I mentioned, which is uh, just pushing singularities towards infinity. But uh, global approximation theorem also holds for uh, any open 
be money and money. It's um, <laughs> and uh, you don't need your metric to be analytic. In fact, uh, it's just electricity of the base. Mm -hmm. So here, I want to apply uh, Tom's theorem. This result ensuring uh, or providing uh, a sufficient condition for structural stability of a level set, plus the Runge theorem, this Runge type, in order to construct uh, global solutions to Hempel with a nodal set, a component of the nodal set with prescribed topology. So again, another remark is what happens with other components. We cannot control other components. So this is uh, just before stating the theorem, because some people asked me about yesterday about uh, what happens with other components. Uh, in general, uh, the, the, the solution will have other components in the zero set, and you cannot control them. <laughs> so you cannot control them. And typically, there will be infinitely many components of the Hempel equation because it's oscillating, etc. Uh, so, so, with these theorems, with these techniques, actually, uh, you can only prescribe finitely many of them. Or infinitely many, but uh, if you prescribe infinitely many, uh, you don't have decay at infinity. But I'm not talking in these lectures about how to prescribe infinitely many components. That's possible. Uh, it's good that you know it, but, uh, but I'm not talking about that. Because it, it requires a refinement of the global approximation theorem, uh, which uh, provides a global approximation, not in the uniform sense, but in the better than uniform sense. This is possible. And with an error function that you can prescribe a priori. But uh, that's more sophisticated. OK. so. So for the statement of the theorem in this lecture, I need a definition. Because uh, I'm going to prescribe in this theorem finitely many components. So things uh, become easier when you assume that these components are not linked in some sense. So the definition of, of not linking is the following. So let sigma 1 Sigma D, D compact hypersurface, hypersurfaces, of Euclidean space, then we say that they are not linked. Hypersurfaces is contained in this domain SI. Or, in other words, the, the hypersurfaces can be separated. I'm going to, to draw a picture now. Contain them. 
so they are unlinked. But uh, you can have hypersurfaces which are linked. For example, for example, something like this. Here. So this is uh, two tori such that a piece of the of, of the sigma one sigma two a piece of sigma two crosses the whole of sigma one. So they cannot be they cannot be separated. If you try to move them in a continuous way without intersections, this is impossible. And actually, there are no contractible domains disjoint, disjoint, which contain uh, each one of the hypersurfaces. Okay. So it's uh, this is not separable. Oh, this is linked. And this one. So this is the picture. So the, the kind of uh, hypersurfaces that I'm going to realize in this theorem are this, only. Although you can do this, but the game is more sophisticated, so <laughs> let's uh, keep things as simple as possible. Uh, but anything can be done. <laughs> that, that's one of the, uh, say, disappointing points of this theorem, that uh, say that essentially anything is possible. Disappointing depends on if you want obstructions or not. I want obstructions, I didn't find any. Apart from easy abstractions, say, or some uh, trivial abstractions. But uh, essentially, everything can be done with, um, with these PDs. Okay, so let's state the theorem. Okay, so the statement So again, uh, we proved this uh, with my colleague Alberto Enciso and there are two papers uh, well, The first one was in 2013 in Advances in Mathematics but here uh, we didn't know how to control the growth at infinity. So then you have to add uh, this other paper that I told you, this paper in ACTA, just to be sure that your solution decays at infinity. So this, is, uh, this will be in the statement, that the solution decays at infinity. So here it's proof without decay. Okay. And here it's not proof because actually this paper is about other things. But uh, there is one of the sections uh, where you prove the global approximation theory with decay. So combining both, you get the following statement. So the statement is, you have uh, these uh, D hypersurfaces, compact. are not linked. Then there exists a, a solution to Hempel U. A global solution of Hempel in Euclidean space and a diffeomorphism P from Rn to itself 
such that if you transform uh, these hypersurfaces with the DQ, such that uh, P sigma 1, P sigma D are structurally stable components components of the nodal set of U is N of U the nodal set of U okay. and moreover U calls off at infinity U is Herbert's. It's uh, Herbert's, and in fact, it's, uh, it has point wise decay. And actually, and in fact, uh, decays. the decay of the global approximation theorem. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so this is the statement. Uh, is it clear? So we have um, we have D, finitely many compact hypersurfaces. I assume that they are not linked, so I don't want these features. It's only, only D. I can separate. Then the claim is that, um, without any other assumption on the hypersurfaces, it's a, just a, I think, yeah, in the first lecture, I defined uh, what the hypersurface is uh, here, which is uh, something without boundary, orientable, smooth. So, in this sense, up to this, uh, up to this uh, easy, Properties of being non-orientable, -orient, uh, without boundary, etc. This is anything. This sigma one, sigma d, or anything. Then there exists a global solution to Hempel, the Laplacian of u plus u equals zero in Euclidean space. This solution is not of any type. Actually, it's a good solution. Is what is called in the literature Herbots. But more than Herbots, it is uh, in the case point-wise uh, as this which is the, the optimal decay, for example, such that for this solution there is a diffeomorphism in Euclidean space, of Euclidean space, such that the transformation, when you deform, when you deform your hypersurfaces with the diffeom, then they become components of the nodal set of U, structurally stable. So this means that if you perturb a bit the function, they persist. So this is important problem. Uh, uh, because in some in lecture four uh, tomorrow probably I'll uh, talk about uh, a problem posed by a theoretical physicist uh, Michael Berry and uh, in physics they are interested in structurally stable properties properties that uh, are satisfied even if you perturb things because that's what happens in lab in the laboratory if you perturb something and it disappears uh, you cannot observe it if it's very unstable it's very difficult to observe so uh, that's why it's important to have the structural stability. Although, of course, maybe the, the size of the perturbation that is allowed, it may be small, but at least it's not uh, zero. <laughs> okay, so this is the theorem. So now let's go to the proof. So in the proof, I'm going to use uh, all these uh, tools that I introduced in second lecture. So let's think before writing uh, the things of the proof. Let's think how we can address uh, it. So uh, I'll follow the strategy that I presented at the beginning of lecture two. So in the strategy, there are two steps. In the first step, I want to construct the local solution. We need the, the local solution V, which is defined in some neighborhood of these hypersurfaces, or is an open set containing the hypersurfaces. Okay, 
I want to construct this. And such that this local solution vanishes on the hypersurfaces. Okay? I need to construct local solutions or neighborhoods of this vanishing on here. Now we'll see how. So a first a thing that one can try is Koshiko Valesky. Now we'll see why Koshiko Valesky doesn't work. But um, okay, so this is the first point. And second, okay, if we are able to construct a local solution, then the globalization it is immediate. It is immediate because of the global extension theorem. Just it will be invocation of this uh, theorem. You don't know even the proof of the theorem. Just invoke, invoke it to say that if uh, if the set, if the compact set. Uh, where your local solution is defined satisfies certain condition, which is that the complement is connected, then you can globalize the solution. Okay, so this part will be easy because uh, we have already uh, worked uh, to prove the global approximation theory. Mm -hmm. But then, for the success of the global approximation, we need that the local solution be robust. I mean, this nodal set of the local solution, if we approximate the local by the global, and the nodal set is destroyed, then we have not done anything. It's not this useful. So we need to use the Tom's theorem, Tom's theorem to guarantee that the local solution has a nodal set that is stable. For this, we will use Tom's theorem for the stability, the structural stability of the local solution. Okay. So just in the proof, let, let's see what happens if we try to use Koshiko-Valesky. So let's focus on, on one component. Something like this, this stigma one. Okay, the statement, in the statement there is always, in all these statements, if not there are fractions, as I said in the first lecture, there are diffeomorphisms. You can move a bit the menu. So, there is no problem in assuming that stigma one is analytic. Okay, no loss of generality, or after, uh, after, after small deformation, after small deformation, this is analytic. Okay, but the density of analytic functions in smooth functions, no problem. So this is not the problem of Koshiko Valesky, of course. You can ensure that it's analytic. The problem is the following. So if you consider uh, the Koshiko Valesky problem, for example, something like this, a plus one. Plus one Acting on B equals zero, B on sigma one is equal to zero because we want it to be zero, and then some uh, some good uh, condition on the normal derivative. So a good condition, for example, to ensure. So this is. So let's uh, let's put the modulus of the gradient of B on sigma one. The normal derivative is equal to one, for example. Something non vanishing to ensure uh, stability. That's why I, I put a 1 here. You can put uh, some other non vanishing function, but, uh, it's, uh, but here uh, it's, easy. it's an easy uh, condition, and uh, in any case, it must be non vanishing if you want the stability. You want the stability. Tom's theorem says that the gradient cannot vanish if you want the stability. But then, this has a solution, of course, but where? where does this solution exist? This exists in a neighborhood, possibly narrow neighborhood, of your set. Okay? So this exists here. Okay? Compact. This is K. Okay, we have the local solution. But now, Let's try to use the global approximation theorem. So what's the condition? There are not many conditions in the global approximation <coughs> theorem, but there is one which is important, and which is that the complement of K must be connected. <coughs> must be connected. But this is not the case here. This is not the case. We have two components. Here. This is the unbounded one. The unbounded one is good. This is good because the poles that appear in the process can disappear. You can push them to infinity. 
But here, the false that would appear in the process if you try to prove the global approximation theorem, you follow the steps that I explained to you in this second lecture. You have false, right? You have the you have the, lo the local solution. You extend by brute force. You represent it as a, as a convolution with the green kernel. You discretize the convolution. You discretize the integral. And in the discretization, in the discretization, you get poles. You get poles here and here. These poles are okay. You can push them to some u. But these poles here, you cannot cross this because if you cross, you destroy the approximation. You want to approximate on k. You cannot cross the region where k is. You cannot cross. So what you can do, of course, is maybe you can, or not maybe, you can indeed. Uh, put all your poles uh, in any open set that you want inside this region. You can put them here. But they cannot disappear. Even you can iterate the process and get only one pole, an essential singularity. But uh, still, it wouldn't be a global solution. It would have a, 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 a singularity, very bad singularity, very wide singularity. So that's why we need the complement uh, to be. Uh, Connected, in fact, because uh, if connected, then it's it's unbounded. It's unbounded. Okay. So the, the important point is that the complement be unbounded. All the components of the complement be unbounded. But in, for compact K, this is equivalent to being connected. Okay. So this doesn't work. You, you cannot use Cauchy covalent. So how how do we proceed then? Okay. So there are. So there are not many ways to construct a local solution with, uh, uh, well, local, semi-local in some sense, because it's not a solution in a neighborhood of a point. It must be a solution in a neighborhood of, uh, of sigma. So there are not many ways. So what we do instead is, um, OK, let's construct a solution which lives inside the whole domain bounded by k. The whole domain. So for this, we we'll consider a boundary value problem. So that's the that's the other way that we know to construct a good uh, local solution. Which is using the, the a boundary value problem. So for the boundary value problem, we need to do some things. Okay, so we would like to do this. So we have, say, sigma 1, sigma 1, and we have the domain bounded by sigma 1. Let's call it uh, omega, I'm going to call it mega tilde, the boundary is sigma 1. Okay. Mm -hmm. But now I'm going to consider this problem. It's the Laplacian, say, of. This will not give the solution for the moment. Just let's uh, show you uh, why this doesn't work again. So Laplacian of W1 uh, plus W1 equals 0 in omega tilde 1, and also omega 1 on the boundary on sigma 1 is equal to 0. Okay, so boundary value problem with Dirichlet boundary condition. Okay, so the problem is that here we have a one. It's not written, but it is of course a one. And uh, one is not in general among in in the Dirichlet spectrum of this domain. If you don't move sigma one, the Dirichlet spectrum will be whatever it be, but almost surely one will not be there. Okay, That's the point. Even if it's there, uh, it could happen that it's not the first eigenvalue, maybe the second, third. But if it's not the first eigenvalue, we have an issue. That's a problem, because for the, if it's not the first eigenvalue, this has uh, this changes sign. And typically, you have nodal regions here and the gradient the gradient of this W1 will vanish at some points. Some points. 
because sign changes, sign changes. So in general, it will vanish. So from this, the moral is that we need a domain such that one is in the Dirichlet spectrum, and actually not only that, but it's the first eigenvalue. We need one to be the first eigenvalue. Okay. So what do we do? Now it's uh, where DPO, where the DPO acts. Now let's change uh, this domain so that you get uh, you get that one is in the Dirichlet spectrum and is the first eigenvalue. So for this, simply let's consider this lambda one. Lambda one is the first Dirichlet eigenvalue, first Dirichlet. Value. So, if the first Dirichlet eigenvalue is smaller than one of this omega tilde, if it's smaller than one, this is because your domain it's uh, it's too large. So, you should shrink it. And if it's uh, bigger, if lambda one is uh, bigger than one. <coughs> It's because uh, your domain is too small. If it's very small, the domain, the first Dirichlet eigenvalue is big. So you have to uh, thicken it, you have to increase it. So, uh, what? Uh, an exercise, very easy exercise, is that uh, if you just scale in the equation, if you have the omega 1 tilde, you define an omega 1 as the scaling, as the dilation of omega tilde with the value of this lambda 1. Lambda 1 is the eigenvalue of omega, of omega tilde. Okay. Then, uh, indeed, this omega 1 will have a first degree eigenvalue, which is 1, actually. That's the scaling. And you can do this, uh, you have to do this uh, for all the domains. Okay, you have several domains. They are separated because of the condition. And um, so for each one, you have this dilation. You have to glue all the dilations. It, it will not be globally a dilation because maybe here this lambda 1 tilde is forever, 0 0.8, and here is 1.3. It, it, the, the dilation is different, but they are separated. You can separate them, so it's possible to uh, to consider the DPO separately and then glue them all. No problem with this. Okay. So at the end of the day, what you get is is a DPO phi prime tilde. So there exists a DPO phi prime, phi prime such that. When you transform, uh, when you transform this omega tilde, this omega tilde, I, then you get something that I will call omega I, having or has first degree eigenvalue equal to one. That's lambda one of omega I is equal to one. For all i. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the first step that you have to do. You have to transform all these things to in order to have first delay again value. Equal to one. Okay. Yes, questions? <coughs> Comments? <coughs> Yeah, yeah that, that's why <laughs> that's why you have to separate it. Uh, well, first you separate, uh, you put them uh, far from each other. Okay, that's why I want it to be unlinked. And then it's possible. And then if, you, if they are pushed uh, far from each other, there are finally many of them, so you can. In each of these uh, contractible domains, you can do the dilation. Yeah. Actually, if they are linked, uh, you can do it, but uh, it's not—it's no longer a dilation. 
if you have to put uh, big balls and you have to add other deformations to it. But, but the feel is possible to deform uh, the whole set so that. But uh, okay, it's more complicated. This can be visualized uh, in an easier way, so that's why it's better to think of this situation. So, uh, so we have. Uh, so now I'm going to work uh, with this omega i, and uh, the boundary of this omega i, I'm going to call it sigma i, sigma i prime. Yeah, this is a diffeomorphic form. So sigma i prime. It's, uh, by the D of P is diffeomorphic to sigma i. Yes, by prime. Okay. So now let's uh, let's construct uh, the local solution. So we consider now it makes sense this uh, eigenvalue problem. So for each i, you have this. Uh, so you can see, so this uh, now this uh, has solution. Now, now one is an eigenvalue. It's the first one. So it's multiplicity. The multiplicity is one. The first eigenvalue has one multiplicity, multiplicity one of the domain for a domain Dirichlet eigenvalue. So it's uh, and so then uh, it's a unique up to constant factor. So let's uh, let's take for example a solution which is positive. In the domain. Okay. So, so now, just uh, just realize that this positivity and Hopf lemma, post boundary point lemma, this solution to the elliptic PDE, which is zero on the boundary and is positive inside, so the Hopf lemma implies that the gradient doesn't match. So implies that the gradient of CI is different from zero at any point. At any point of the boundary of sigma prime. So this is good because this will be Tom's condition, this is Tom's condition. So the gradient does not match. We can apply Tom. Here in this case, uh, it's uh, easy. To, it's easy to get uh, to get this condition, but in other uh, situations, or other PDEs, or for other uh, mainly the, in the case of the non-compact hyperspaces, this is a very delicate issue to be able to get uh, not only that the gradient doesn't vanish, but that the interval of the gradient is possible. That's not easy in general. But here it was quite easy. Just direct application. Of Okay, so so we are essentially uh, almost done because now So now, just uh, another observation. Another observation. Is that uh, these uh, functions, this ci, are defined in the domain omega i. But actually, since c 
sigma prime i is uh, analytic, you can assume that it's analytic, this sigma prime i, then uh, this psi uh, can be extended a bit across sigma prime i because of the analyticity. So psi can be analytically extended extended to an open neighborhood and i of uh, the closure of the domain omega. Okay. So now we are in the situation to apply the global approximation theorem. So let's uh, let's set the following the following objects. So this approximation you can do it, for example, using Cauchy equivalent. But it, it's a, it's a quite general result actually. So now you can set. <coughs> So the set K, so in the global approximation theorem, uh, it's stated in terms of a, of a set K, a compact set. So who is the compact set K here? So K will be simply the union of all this uh, omega i, of all this closed domain, the closure of the This will be K. Okay. And our local solution B, the, the local sol the B in the statement of the global approximation theorem, will be in each one of these uh, domains, it will be Ci. Ci in actually, uh, actually in Ni. Okay, this we have extended a bit uh, the Ci. This Ni contains. So the union of Ni contains K. Okay. So, and of course, um, the Laplacian of B plus B is equal to zero in K. Now uh, we can uh, apply the global approximation theorem because if you if you look at the complement of k, so let's look now at the complement of k. So k is so who is k? So k is each one of these uh, domains. There are several. It's disconnected in general. If we want to prescribe uh, several components. different topologies in general. So if you analyze the complement, so Rn minus this set K, this is connected. It's uh, all of this. I have holes here, but you can cross them. It's connected. So you can apply the global approximation theory. So what you get is uh, so global approximation theorem global approximation theorem uh, implies that there exists a U satisfying the equation. equal to zero in the whole space. Uh -huh. And in which decays. And such that approximate B in K, such that the difference between U and B measure in any CK norm that you want. Set K is small enough. 
is as small as you want. It's smaller than delta. Okay. So now to finish, so this is the first point. And to finish the argument, just uh, look at uh, the nodal set of you in, in this neighborhood, or in this open set, and I in each one of these. So, now you apply Tom's theorem. Now you apply Tom's theorem. So, since these are close enough, this is U and P, and you control the zero set of D in, the, in this neighborhood, which is precisely given by the sigma by the sigma prime of i, then uh, Tom's theorem, Tom's condition is satisfied, Tom's condition holds, holds because this, because the gradient of this function v on each one of this, uh, I call it sigma prime of i is different from zero at any point. Then the Tom's theorem implies the existence of a diffio. There exists a diffio. P prime prime. Such that. Capital K. Capital K, yes. Maybe omega i may be replaced by an no. Never. So. Maybe, sorry? Yeah, uh, that's all. Ah, NI. Uh, NI must be contained. Uh, yeah. Yeah, omega i is replaced by, should be replaced by an ant? No. Because uh, on the boundary of omega i, oh, yes. vanish. So then. On the boundary of omega i, vanishes, right. And so it is a bit bigger. And i? And i is bigger. It's bigger, yeah. Yeah, so. Contained, yeah. So that's why, so that uh, k must be. Uh, bigger, uh, a bit bigger. bigger. A little bit bigger. A little bit bigger, yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. So, yeah. so the emission uh, may be uh, omega i is depressed by NI, no? Depressed? Uh, depressed? Depressed. depressed. Ah, replaced, no, replaced. Depressed. Oh, by uh, uh, a slightly larger. Uh, no, no, but uh, because I want. Uh, because in the, yes, uh, in the statement, yeah. I, yes, I state. Uh, that the, the, the PD is satisfied in a compact set, yes. this meaning tacitly that there exists uh, an A N containing K. So, yes, no, ah. no need of uh, it, it's tacitly assumed in the. Ah, the assume, yeah, 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 when I say that the PD is satisfied in compact set, it uh, means that it's satisfied in, in open set containing it. So, yes. Uh, yeah. And the. Uh, yeah, I, I want to include in the in the compact set, of course, the, the boundaries of uh, because it's where the set is zero. Yeah, and actually, it doesn't vanish in any other part of the set because of the construction. Because if the gradient is not zero, the gradient is not zero. So you can apply Tom's theorem. Then there exists the diffeomorphism such that. V prime prime applied to V it's a set of components components of the nodal set of V okay. this, uh, this is a consequence of Tom's theorem and uh, so the proof is finished well and finally of course uh, uh, the diffio in the statement, I call it V, this will be composition of all the diffios during the group, so it will be something like this V prime prime composed with V prime. Okay. The first V prime was done in order to, uh, it, this was this composition of translations with dilations, so that you remember phi prime. Uh, was done in order to ensure that the first Dirichlet eigenvalue is one, and now second, second phi comes from Tom, from Tom's theorem, from the proposition. This is 
zone, and this comes from the fertility layer model. There should be a third one, which is to make everything analytic. <laughs> I, I don't write it. <laughs> okay, and this finishes the this finishes the tool. So as you see, uh, once you have uh, uh, Tom's theorem and the global approximation theorem, the proof of this is uh, relatively simple. Okay. Probably here the only idea is how to construct uh, this local solution so that uh, you have uh, the condition of the complement, the condition that the complement uh, must be uh, connected, this, this condition, which is something you always have to ensure, and the condition of tone. So you, you always have, for any problem of this type, and this can be applied in many, many contexts, more probably than you can imagine, in uh, vector magnetism, Maxwell equations, fluid mechanics, uh, parabolic equations, in many, many things, Schrodinger operators. Uh, always the point is you, you already have the, the strategy, local solution, global approximation. Local solution, you have to be very careful in the construction because you need to satisfy two things, this topological condition on the complement and this structural stability. And sometimes it's not so easy to get these two conditions because of the, the way of the construction and okay. And of course the structural stability is much, much, much harder when you study vector fields or other kind of uh, objects, tensor fields or other more complicated objects and functions. Then the structural stability is not a consequence of top because your object of the study is not a level set, it's an integral curve. A vector field, then the corresponding uh, keyword is hyperbolicity, for example, or ellipticity. Or you want to study an invariant torus of a vector field, then the keyword is Kolmogorov Arnold Moser theorem. Or you want to study other, other things. So uh, the more complicated the object you want to study, the more sophisticated the, the stability theorem that you want to apply and up to the level that there are no stability theorems, so you kind of ensure that there exists a global solution. Okay, so with this, um, I finish uh, this uh, third lecture. Now in these last five minutes, just uh, I tell you an overview of the, so tomorrow it will be the last session, uh, and I, I present uh, three applications in some sense. Excuse me. Sorry. Can you ask her? There is a name, Herbos. Herbos, yeah. Why are Herbos out here? Oh, because of the decay, yes. <laughs> yes, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Herbos theorem. It can be used as a Herbos function. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yes, you use. Uh, so Herlock's wave function, Herlock's solution to, uh, to Hempel. So, so you have the Hempel's equation. Okay, so if, you, if this u is bounded, or as in this case, even the case, you can uh, Fourier transform this. So let's, uh, so the space, uh, let's call C, the Fourier variable. So in this case, this is, like this. Okay, so what you get is that your Fourier transfer is supported on C equal 1. So, in general, there is a special class, not any solution to Hempel is of this type, but there is a special class of solutions that are called Herlots, where you, your function u, which is a solution to Hempel, can be written this way. It's, uh, so it's the Fourier transform of uh, of a, a, a 
distribution on the n minus one dimensional sphere, well, this is not very bad. <laughs> this is inner two. Okay, this is the definition. <coughs> but then there is, um, and you can define Herglots this way. But uh, uh, then uh, either either you can define in a different way, or you prove a theorem, uh, this which is sometimes called Herglots lemma, which says that this is equivalent to the to the function to the solution satisfying uh, this Ahmon Forman condition. Decay condition, which is not uh, which is not point wise, but it's something of this type. Is you integrate, so you integrate over a ball of radius r, divided by one over r, and, what, and you integrate u square, okay, and this is finite, well, the supremum. If you take the supremum of r. Then this is fine, a more formander condition. This is equivalent to this. So any Herglot solution satisfies a more formander. And conversely. So uh, so of course if your solution u decays as one over over x and to the modulus n minus one over two, then this condition is uh, this is this is point wise, okay? But uh, implies this, not conversion. Not any, not any Herglot point uh, has point wise uh, decay in principle. But uh, so this is so this is uh, of this type. There exists a measure on the uh, measure, well, measure, some distribution or what? Well, actually, it's an L two function on the sphere such that your u can be represented this way. And uh, your, in all these proofs, uh, we have not used this. Indeed. But uh, tomorrow, if I have time, I use this representation for the third application, which is how to extend this theorem to Euclidean space with periodic boundary conditions. Say the torus. To prove this theorem on the n-dimensional torus, I use this Herglots. I use the fact that u is actually Herglots. Okay. Yes, I think I'll stop here. Okay.